Good evening. Um, welcome to this uh, conversation about bridging differences. Um, we are delighted and honored to have Joel Stein with us, who has written for a variety of publications for close to 20 years. He wrote a column for Time. He's written for the Los Angeles Times. He's worked on pilots. He's taught at Princeton. He has a wide and varied resume um, and uh, is someone who I think has a lot of wisdom uh, to share with us. We actually had originally <laughs> invited Joel to come um, a year ago, uh, and you know what happened a year ago. Uh, and so we are finally, we are delighted to finally be able to have this conversation. And of course, in the past year, it is not as though bridging differences has gotten easier. So we may be at least in, as much in need of wisdom about the com about this conversation now as we would have been had we honored the original day. So first of all, welcome. And I think as an opening question, um, I'm going to ask you what what in how do you characterize the divide in American society? Like forget for a minute our congregation and our community and the Jews, but just in America in general, what's been happening to us? Yeah, I think you know my last book was about this and about politics <clears throat> I called it in defense of elitism and anytime you have a guy with a humor column writing about politics things are bad like that yeah. i should be writing about <laughs> family and you know sports like this is not what i should be doing so we've gotten real tribal you know it's to the point at which a person who has a republican who has a child doesn't want them marrying a democrat and vice versa so it's become a key part of your identity, which of these two political tribes you're in, not just in America, but I think in most countries. Yep. So I'm particularly interested, I know you told me not to talk about your congregation when you asked me this question, but I'm interested in the fact that you have a really divided congregation. And, yeah. and I just, it's, I don't know how you deal with that. And I'm, I'm very curious. And because look, we're, we're Jews. That's our community that we that we were born into, and if you belong to a temple, you choose that community. But you also now have this other tribe, and that other tribe right. is becoming a real big part of your identity. So, how do you still be part of the Jewish community and be part of that tribe, and deal with people on a weekly basis or on holidays who are not part of that tribe? Um, the other I, tribe being on the right or your tribe on the right or your tribe on the left. Yeah, I don't, my, my wife's not comfortable being friends with people who voted for Donald Trump. And that's a problem. You know, it, you know, we're very isolated, so we don't have that many friends who fall in that camp. But, it, but occasionally we do, and it's an issue. And if I were yeah. part of a community that was really split, like a Jewish community that was split, I think, you know, you, you start to have to choose which tribe is more important than the other tribe. So let me let me actually give you a practical example that I came up against very recently. Um, I did a review of Jordan Peterson's new book for the LA Review. I, I have not read that. I've heard him talk about it. So um, so I did a review of his book, and I decided <laughs> I decided that I was going to actually review the book. In other words, I wasn't going to go into it thinking he was great or he was terrible. Right. Because, again, it's so divided. And there were things I really liked about the book. And there were things I objected to about the book. And, and I have to say, I have been really delighted and surprised by the response. A lot of people have written to me and said, thank you for not trashing him, even though there are things that you disagree about. Or thank you for not ignoring these things that I dislike about him. Um, there were a couple who said, you know, either... Why, how could you criticize anything or, or why didn't you criticize everything? But I think if you really are sincere and you try to give people the benefit of the doubt but still have criticisms, <clears throat> most people will listen and respond, at least if they get to the end of the review. So for, for those who don't know, Jordan Peterson is a Canadian, I think probably a Canadian who doesn't really like Trump, um, but he is a, for Canada, for academics in Canada, he's a professor, he is a conservative. Uh, and for some people on the left, simply engaging with his ideas is verboten because because he's considered a, a bad guy because of things he said about the trans community and other people. So so you were nervous about even engaging with that text. 
I was nervous, but I, I was determined to, to give it what I thought would be a fair reading and see where the chips fell and see if I gave it a fair reading, if it, if it would be well. Anyway, you can find it on, on, the, on the site. It's on the LA Review book site. Um, and and it's, I, it's, it's doing, I mean, it's, it's being read by a lot of people because it's their most read column now. I think a lot of people want to read about Peterson in general. Um, but I do think the same thing here. I mean, one of the ways of bridging differences is by not agreeing with either side. Is that a strategy? Well, for you, you mean? For anyone. I think oh, for anyone. For remain neutral. That is, this is the chamber. In other words, not, not even neutral, but there are, there are very, very hard people on either side. Like the, the, but it's a small percentage. And then there are people on either side who, if you listen to them and honor them and respect them and disagree in a certain way, I think they will be able to hear it. I think that's becoming harder and harder. Now, if you're talking yeah. about individual issues like gun control or abortion, that may be possible. But if you're talking about Trump, uh, I think that's more difficult. What about if you're talking about Biden? Do you think there is the same degree of polarization? No, no, I think he's, you know, deliberately milk toast. I mean, he is the restoration. So probably not, but I think that's not what, if you, if you do a search of whose name is mentioned more to this day, right, right. clear Trump over Biden. No one. Yeah. Really, yeah. So I think that, that the battle is over this new nationalism. Not so about, that's what I was going to ask you next is, do you think it's a person or do you think it's, I mean, like if tomorrow Trump, you know, decided I'm going to go to Elba, yeah. um, <laughs> do you think there would still, there would still be that, you know, I'm sure of it, just because other countries, you know, we could name the Trump of almost every country, right? We can name our Victor right. Orban, our, uh, you know, uh, our Boris Bolsonaro Johnson. Bolsonaro and, and yeah. on and on, right. Yeah, so our Modi's. So, so yes, there is someone who's going to fill his shoes after him uh, in our country. So, yes, no, there's a, there's a rising nationalism everywhere. And I think, you know, when I was growing up, the left and the right differed significantly, but it was mostly about like how much socialism you want to dip into your capitalism, how much capitalism you want to dip into your socialism. Now I feel like it's something a little more basic about your, your, your basic values and what you think a country should be. And I think that's that's a deeper fight. These are these are deep issues. I think people are fighting over. Well, OK, but you wrote a book in defense of elitism that suggests that you that you are not doctrinaire on one side. No, what, why not? What do you mean? I think I am. Because, because the left would, is, is opposes elitism, right? I mean, that's a progressive bogeyman, elitism. And, and you obviously identify more of, on the left than on the right. And yet you're writing something that I think a lot of people on the right would be very comfortable signing on to. Probably not. I mean, yes, it is a concept. But in, in reality, when I talk about elitism, I'm talking about that um, cosmopolitan globalism, that, you know, liberal democracy, that uh, I think has become okay. quite unpopular yeah. among the right. So, so I, when I talk about bridging the divide between these two groups that are represented at your synagogue, one strategy I take is is not to be neutral, but to have kind of a extreme radical curiosity that my friend Michael Green and I disagree on this all the time. His take is when you see a Nazi, you punch a Nazi. Whereas my thought is when you see a Nazi, like I'm curious, I have a lot of questions about how you came to that, like, and, and what you really want. And, and to, to be able to approach something that you find frightening, and vile with a, with a curiosity, I think opens up an opportunity for seeing humanity in other people and getting along with them. So I think that that's, I mean, that it's a wonderful point and a really important one. And I think that it, it leads me to, to recognize that 
sometimes we think we know how other people think and therefore don't need to ask them when in fact we, we don't actually know. So, uh, yeah. so have you, have you had this, uh, have you had any re revelations about? For sure. Yeah. Like the, the first thing when Trump got elected, I totally freaked out because, mm -hmm. uh, plenty of Republicans have been elected in my lifetime. That's fine. But there hadn't been some, a populist, some of an anti-elitist elected since probably Jackson. So I didn't know what was gonna happen. And I, I really was scared, like physically uh, frightened of, of the end of democracy. I didn't know what would happen if, if Muslims would be rounded up. Like I just didn't know what was about to happen. So when I get scared, um, what I tend to do is look for reassurance from people who disagree with me because they're never quite as scary as I hope. I think there's a chance they're not as scary as I think, like you said. So um, the first third of my book is me. I found that the county in America that had the highest percentage of Trump voters. And I went there for a week and just hung out with people there. And it was in uh, the panhandle of Texas, very rural town. Uh, called Miami, Texas, spelled Miami, it's in Roberts County. And I was expecting having read Hillbilly Elegy, I was expecting like toothless mamas and pawpaws who were just racist. And, um, and what I found was this is actually a pretty well-educated community. A lot of them went to college, pretty well off, very rural, extraordinarily Christian and Baptist and religious, um, but not that in the end, it's a tiny town. Um, oil and gas mostly some old ranching families but not that different than me and didn't and weren't as evil as i kind of feared uh, i certainly i disagreed with what they thought the country should be um but i was a right. little less and i'm still frightened of what would happen if um if a if they pick a strong man to run our country into a christian religious um theocracy which i think is what they would choose or what Ted Cruz or Josh Hawley would choose. That scares me, but less so than I imagined before I listened to them. What did you, what did you learn from them that you didn't know beforehand? That they, they knew more about my life than I knew about theirs. Just by nature of, you, you can only stay in this town for so long before, if you have money, before you want to travel somewhere. So they'd been right. to California or New York or Europe. They, um, they watched TV and movies. So they knew a ton about my life and I knew nothing about theirs. They didn't want to roll the country back as far as I thought. Um, you know, my fear was 1840. They were more like 1980. Um, so I guess I learned, and, and you know, I learned that in some ways the dystopia they see in our lives, which is right. us not knowing our neighbors, us walking by homeless people on the street, um, us being on our phones all day and not connecting with each other. They're, they're afraid that's what America is becoming and they're not entirely wrong. Yeah, I mean, the, the, one of the things that I think is true about both sides is that they see their own virtues and are blind to the things about their own lives that strike the other side as being just terrible, terrible, terrible. Um, and, and that's one of the things that makes me wonder if in fact this difference can be bridged because when you're looking through two different kinds of filters it's really hard to shift it so that you can see things the way the other person does but even if we were able to do that one thing i kind of wanted to ask you about because i imagine you've thought about it more than me not just because you're smarter than me but because you've read so much about these topics is I've always thought there's kind of a continuum that each of us have between truth and peace. That, that there's some point in which you will not give up your truth for, for peace. And at some point you will bend your truth towards peace. So, so I think for some people, this is the, the buttons that Trump pushed or that this nationalism pushed uh, was what, I, I won't put up with that person in my community. So like we, we can both agree, right. we could pick an example from the left because that might be more palatable. But like if somebody was a follower of Pol Pot 
and they wanted to kill everyone with glasses or, you know, and move to an agrarian society and put everyone else in re-education camps. We may not want them at our temple, right? We may not want right. to hang out with them. So how do you navigate that at this time when there's these two camps that are about very, very, probably the most intense things probably since World War II, as far as our values. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's more than the civil rights movement or not. It's hard yeah, to say. Okay, let's say the sixties, um, but, but it's still a so, big, it's been a while. So there are, look, there were people, there are people, believe it or not, on both sides of the political spectrum who left the synagogue, left and right. Um, because I either wouldn't stand up every week and give an anti-Trump sermon or because I would engage with people on the left and because we did talk about racism. So the, for, for some people on the right, that was equivalent to saying BLM should, should burn our cities down. Um, and for people on the left, it was the equivalent of saying, we support you know, concentration camps on the border if you don't. And so you're right, if you see it in absolute terms, then there is no, <laughs> you're sunk. You're, I mean, what can you do? You are sunk. Um, but, but part of the advantage, at least in theory of the synagogue, is you can create a neutral space where you can talk about, this is the beauty of Shabbat and leave one of the things that, that is so, um, to me, is, is a daily frustration is that because we don't have a common culture anymore, politics is the only thing that everyone shares. We don't watch the same movies, we don't read the same books, we don't listen to the same music, on and on and on. So if I meet somebody at a coffee shop, if we were ever meeting people at coffee shops, the only thing I know I can talk to them about, they're gonna have an opinion about Trump. They're going to, no question. Um, and that, that means the politics starts to swallow everything else, but I try in the synagogue to keep some of the everything else still, still alive. It's interesting. I always think that like politics and tech and economics have dominated our discussion for so long. Whereas like yeah. you look historically, it's like people used to meet at coffee houses and argue about opera, right? Like there used to be right. like really argue about opera, like angrily walk out and have fights at the opera. Um, and, and that's just not, you know, we're not living in, yeah. in Vienna, you know, no, no. 1800s. So what, but if you had a congregation during the 60s, let's talk about the civil rights movement as an equivalent, and right. there was someone who was a segregationist, just like, you know, segregation now, segregation always, I'd understand if people didn't want that person around. So would I, so would I. I mean, so, that's the problem is, the, the problem is, not the problem, a problem is how absolute do you see the other side? If you see the other side absolutely, then that then what happens is you do leave the synagogue. And that is exactly what happened. One, one person said to me, if you're not speaking out against him every day, then you're abetting his mission and I'm leaving. And that was how they felt about it. Wow. And in your history as a rabbi, have you felt that way before? Uh, the only time that I felt like I had to speak out despite the fact, I'm mean, well, there were two times that I gave sermons that had strong political valence before Trump. Um, one was the Iran deal, which I opposed then and oppose now. Um, and the other was for same-sex marriage. Um, that, and, and when I said that I would do same-sex marriages, that was a, a huge explosion at the, same, uh, so at the time. That one's easier for me because the Iran one, as Jews, even if you think the Iran deal was great, I imagine you can kind of let that one slide. But the gay marriage right. rights thing, that, that's a pretty core issue where you it can was. tell someone is, is a good person or a bad person. Like that, that's very divisive. Right. That was that's very, it, it was, it was, it was literally, it literally was on the front page of the New York and the LA Times. That's how big an explosion. Yeah. So, and, and, and it was because I felt like I couldn't hold it in anymore because I, I was just, uh, I mean, people would come to me and say, could you marry us? And, and, and 
I wanted to, and I wanted to be able to say yes, but I couldn't do it before I talked to the congregation and said, yeah, I, this is. So, however, having said that, that does it, the people who opposed gay marriage in my congregation, I didn't feel like you're terrible people. I didn't feel that at all. In fact, I remember that 15 years before, nobody right. for their okay. marriage. Nobody. So what is all of a sudden you're a terrible person if you hold the same opinion that everybody held 15 years ago? It doesn't make sense. Not so, even 15 years, right? Because everyone not, on that probably not. Page. Yeah. Um, probably not. Um, yeah. But the, so yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just thinking that that's kind of what uh, when you asked me things I noticed when I was in Texas. <clears throat> what I noticed was that things didn't feel like they were moving in a progressive way very quickly because I live in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. but to them, things were moving so fast that gay marriage is a great example. Just, you know, th they had not adjusted to this new idea at all yet. Um, and, and we were judging them for not moving fast enough. Right. And you forget right. that this is moving very fast for a group of people who, when I had, you know, dinner with them after church uh, in someone's house, there was only enough room at the table for half of us. So the men yeah. sat in the good room, the women sat in the other room and served us our food first. And, yeah. and that, you know, when I brought up that that was weird, they, they, they just hadn't thought about it. So, so you're, you're asking. Really? Them, they never, they never considered it. No, it was just kind of the way things were, you know, why, why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you want to be yeah. nice to your husband? Like, the, you know, the right. way they phrased exactly. it was, they just yeah. hadn't, they'd not been asked to inspect that. And right. now they're being asked to inspect trans rights. And, yeah. and that's a, that's a couple of jumps before you get there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there's no nothing. question about it. So, so, okay. Before we talk about the specifics of what's at stake here and why people, why this might be even bigger. What do you think of that? Or what have you, what do you think? And what have you read about this framing I made up about truth versus peace and how you navigate that? I, I think that you're right. I mean, that's why like, I, that's why the gay marriage thing was not, was not, I mean, it wasn't a peace one. It was a truth one. Um, and, and I think that for a lot of people that's true. Although there's, a, there are so many stops along the way that it's not binary. You know, you can be more truthful, more peaceful. And, and, and what, I, what I really thought about it, and I wonder what you, you think about this, is that in a certain sense, it defines two different functions of a rabbi. Some people see the rabbi as basically a peacemaker. You're just supposed to keep a community together and you're supposed to get along with people. And other people see the rabbi in a prophetic role. No, you're supposed to you know, scream the truth from the rooftops. Um, and both of those tug at uh, somebody who's a, uh, who has any kind of community. So, okay, now you're a rabbi, which are you? Are you a peacer or a truther? <laughs> rabbi I, Stein, so <laughs> I just made you a rabbi for the purposes of this uh, YouTube. I mean, how do you think you would, if you were oh. leading a congregation, how do you think you would make that I mix? I, I am so non-confrontational and so into peacekeeping that um, I have no backbone. So I, I would, there would be, I, it would be sad. I would never be a rabbi. But what, <laughs> when you were at rabbinical school and you read, uh, and you, you guys would talk about this, or, or when you've read, read texts about rabbis from the past, but before yeah. you ask that, what is the, I don't know much about Hasidim or Orthodox, is it? Isn't there a rabbi and a rebbe, and do they play those two roles? No, no, it's the same. A, a rebbe is just a Hasidic rabbi, and every rabbi has that. Every rabbi has that tension of any kind. So, for example, let me, uh, the most famous example is Heschel. Heschel in the conservative movement um, marched with Martin Luther King. Was very big in the civil rights movement. What people forget is Heschel also wrote about how politics should not be in the pulpit. He saw the civil rights movement as a uniquely, you know, important cause. But he said, don't give sermons from the New York Times. He said, a political party, the purpose is power. A spiritual position, the purpose is soul and spirit. So even somebody who is usually adduced as the example of the truth person was teaching that, in fact, 
although there could be an exception, the civil rights movement may be an exception, but for the most part, that's not the task of the rabbi. But this exception seems to happen fairly often. Like, I think it happens more often than it should. I don't think rabbis should take political positions by and large. I really don't. And that's why when you asked me, I said I had two examples, not 30, two. I've never taken a position on gun control or the minimum wage or a billion other issues in public. I may have positions in private, but I don't take them in public because I think that's not, I don't think being a rabbi gives me a special insight into this. I don't know more about it than you do. So how historically have rabbis? Like when- Both ways, every, every way possible. Depends, I think it depends in part on the character of the rabbi. But the question is, since you're the guest and you're supposed to tell us how to bridge differences, you tell me, what would you do given a community that's so divided? Like what would you, um, knowing how, knowing the mutual incomprehensibility that, that two different communities have, um, what, would, what steps would you take if you were in the community, not to the rabbi, but to, you're speaking out to the community itself, what would you tell them? I, I, I know what I would say, but it's been so ineffective that I, I don't think it would work, but it, it doesn't work in my own house with my own wife. So I don't think it's gonna work in a, in a temple. I, I really want people to sit with people they disagree with. And, and whenever they do, they walk away annoyed because they said, well, I told them this and they'd still think that. That's what I always hear. I've read columns in the New York Times about how yeah. like, I listened, I, li- I talked to Trump voters. We had a conversation. They still, they still think this. I'm like, well, that's not a conversation. That's right. just you arguing with someone. I, I, I would want people and I want a structured way in which people can listen to each other with this kind of radical curiosity where you're not trying to convince the other person. You're not even trying to like, um, you're not even trying to figure out if you like the other person. You're not, you're not trying to, bridging is almost the wrong word because you're not trying to get to their side. You're just trying to understand. You have to be curious. If you think Trump is the end of democracy and, um, and, and a real threat to, to the American way of life, which, which is what I think. If, if you believe that, and, and then you believe half of America disagrees with you, some of whom are very smart, you have to be curious, and, and half the world right now, more, doesn't like the, doesn't like democracy. I've been trying to pitch a show called Democracy Meh, in which I go around the world and the country, and and just with a real open mind say maybe democracy is not the best thing. Maybe right. living under a strong man like a Putin or an Orban or is is better. People seem to like it. Historically, there haven't been many democracies. Yeah. Our, country, our country is what three Joe Biden's old. Like my dad, my dad <laughs> three is, Joe Biden's old. It is. It's I mean I think about my dad's always reassuring me about how my, my dad's super smart. Um and's read way more history than me. He's always assuring me that this country's been through so much and so many times. And then I think my dad's 80. My dad's seen a third of it. And it it's yeah. almost falling apart a couple times. That doesn't give me a ton of faith. Like the heart of the only other democracy that's been around as long as us in Greece wasn't much, the real heart of it wasn't much more than 300 years. So like, this isn't naturally how people come together. So to have a real curiosity about why people don't dig this uh, and what they would rather, what they like about the other op- option is a radical thing to do. And it's a radical way to think. And you just have to be interested in, in those answers, I think. And, that's, a, that's an important first step well, of getting along with it. At least, at least a part of it has to be where they came from. Like if you live in China, Xi Jinping, I mean, is a lot better than where you came from. And the improvement in your life means a lot. And I think that that's true in other places too. But, but if, you're, if you live in Britain, for example, so there is a heritage there, a democratic heritage, because you're not, you don't remember that the last guy, you know, was Mao who killed all the intellectuals, among others. Um, that would, be, I think, that would be a fascinating uh, show. So there, 
anybody out there who wants to <laughs> send, Joel, send Joel Stein around the world. Um, and uh, and did, were you, um, at the end of four years, this is really not the, the topic of the conversation, but I'm curious. At the end of four years, did you say, um, well, maybe he didn't do the damage that I thought he would do, or did you feel he did all the damage that I thought he would do? Mostly, I felt like he was largely incompetent as a strongman, and things weren't as bad as I feared they would be. Uh, he made a good run at the end, I thought, of trying to dismantle democracy. Um, you know, even that seems sort of chaotic and not pretty well thought out compared to what other strongmen have done as far as getting the military on their side, oh. getting business on their side. So what so, your my 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 solution, by the way, to this is to have everybody have dinner with someone who disagrees with them. And the conversation can only be about politics, but you are only allowed to express the other person's point of view. You're not allowed to express your own. And that way you have to. So let me ask you. Give me like your best the, the people that you heard. What's the best case for Trump? By the way, that is a great solution. And I, I know someone that was working on that. Um, yeah. Uh, and they've been having these very successful dinner parties where people have to do that. I think it's great. I think I should suggest it to Adam Grant. Um, yeah. Since he's the one who... Uh, so. I, of course. Yeah. I, I'm, I'll, Adam knows everybody. He's the best. But the... Um, <clears throat> Yeah, that's something, would you consider doing that with your congregation? Sure, I would, absolutely. I mean, I think I could make a very good case either way. I, I have strong views, but I think that I could make a very good case either way. And I, I, I have talked enough with partisans of both sides that I really think I could do justice to why they believe that despite this, this, and this, he either was good or wasn't good. Um, and, and also I am, I am, uh, mindful of the fact that uh, that in Israel, his um, approval ratings were like 80, 90 percent. Um, and and they're not <laughs> and, and Israelis are not a stupid people. Um, so no, and, and to have that conversation be about it, it's very hard to have a conversation about a single individual. Right. So I think having a conversation about immigration from the other side or some or Western civilization or whatever the core values are that people are afraid of are fighting over uh, these yeah. nationalist values. I think, I think right. that's how I would frame the conversation more than about Trump. Cause it, I it think that would be, be I think tiny little piggy in the details about the man. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's a worthwhile exercise for sure. Uh, I think just making, instilling some of the, that, that's what they do in debating clubs right you, they give you walk in i think so right they switch them back and forth yeah, yeah. Uh, it makes you really explore the issue from both sides because you don't know which side you're going to get um i think that i think that's a really good tool so do you have hope for i mean for the do you think that, that we're going to get more divided less divided what's the trends that you see i got out of the the prediction game when Trump got elected, because I thought there was a 0% chance of that. So uh, that's, the, that's the, I mean, this is like, I sort of feel this way about the pandemic too, which is a horrible thing to say. It's a horrible yeah, thing to I'm, say about living. I was natural. told, think about this, but I was told you can leave your questions on Zoom or Q&A on YouTube or wherever. So please go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I mean, again, with this radical curiosity idea, that's the fun of living through history which is, you have no idea how this thing's going to turn out. Like, is this just, a, you know, a last fevered moment for, uh, you know, countries before global capitalism swallows up the idea of a nation state? Or is this, or is this the dark ages where we're going to take a step backwards for a while um, and, and, and divide up in ways, because people, people may be very, very uncomfortable with this idea of losing their identity and their tribe, which is which is what's happening. And you know, especially it's hard in America because we're so devoted to the values, the the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, this this Enlightenment idea. But it's easier if you pick a country like Sweden or France, where part of being Swedish or French is the language and the food and the you know the, the mores and like it, and 
and, and that's changing. And, and that's really what's at stake in America. I remember when Joe Biden ran for president in what, 2008, is that the right year? Um, I followed him around for a day and a half. I was following a bunch of candidates and we were in Iowa and we were, um, no one cared about Joe Biden. He was doing horribly and he couldn't, he couldn't attract more than 10 people in a room. So we were upstairs at some kind of bookstore coffee house. And there was a bunch of older democratic ladies, like pretty old uh, that showed up to see Joe Biden. And they started asking him what he was gonna do about Mexicans. And he was, he was not prepared for that. You could tell. He was like, I'm in Iowa. There's not a Mexican for a million, you know, or a thousand miles. What, what are they talking about? And, and, and he had a real hard answer about America being the country of the immigrants. And it did not go over well. And I think, I think that was the first time that, that he and I both saw this question about what is America? What do we want it to be? I spent a couple of days in 2000, I get these years confused because I'm old now, 2016 with Milo Yiannopoulos at his apartment in London. Do you remember him? I he do. Was, yeah, uh, the British nationalist figure in, a, yes. in America too. And he, um, and he was very clear about like, what is, what is a Western value? Like, wh what are the texts? Wh what are the great things we've added to civilization? And will they be replaced? I mean, it's the same right. conversation we had about the canon when, in the 90s at, in Ivy League schools. But, yeah. but that's, that's the conversation. The conversation is about Dr. Seuss books. It, it, right. It's about, it, these are real important conversations about what you want your culture to be that are more important to people than like, you know, a $1.9 billion stimulus package. So, uh, well, that you raised a really important point. I just want to share with you one or two comments that have been made on the Facebook page. One person says, I live in West Texas. We're not backwards. Um, I just want to- Sure, to West them. Texas. Sorry. Yeah, not North Texas. <laughs> okay. um, and someone else said, I have dinner every night with people who disagree with me. It's called being Persian. Thank you, Carolyn, for that uh, comment. So sometimes inside families, that's just what you do. Um, but I think you, you put your finger on a point that I think is actually enormously important and, and generally overlooked. And, and that is that, the biggest issues are actually not the ones that we fight about all the time. Like most of what America is doing abroad, good or bad, in countries all over the world, through the CIA, through the NSA, through, through war, through what's going on in Afghanistan, nobody talks about it. I mean, maybe it's great, maybe it's terrible, but the point is we'll talk about Dr. Seuss endlessly, even though that actually doesn't in the end it's not the key, you know, factor in America. And what's in the $1.9 trillion stimulus? None of us know. That's a much bigger issue. But the problem is that the big issue, there are so many issues in the world that require genuine research and expertise. Yes. And, and we can't, I mean, who, I can't read, you know, I can't read a, a 600 page bill. But, but I'm not sure Steve Bannon was wrong because he said politics is downstream of culture. And I think if right. you know where you stand on Dr. Seuss, it sort of dictates to some degree where you are on our foreign policy. They're, they're not- I, I, I wonder though, if, I wonder if that's because the people that you follow say that, and if you were presented with all the facts and ideas, I wonder if you would be completely consistent. I don't know. I don't know. No, you wouldn't be completely consistent, I don't think. But right. I, think, I think you, you just, I think we're having a fight right now about what the values of our country are. Now, to, to, I, I am one of the few people I know who vote largely on foreign policy because I just, I know we have a huge, beyond huge compared to anyone else, military. And we, we do, it affects people all over the world and, yes. and we don't care when we vote. And that's a scary, scary thing to have an empire where people don't care about being right. an empire. Um, but I do think this fight over Josh Hawley's view of the world versus, um, you know, uh, the AOC is, is a real fight. And, and it's- No, I, I agree with that. Yeah. 
I certainly agree with that. But I think that most people actually don't think about those fights. They think in, in certain symbolic issues and assume yep. that takes care of everything. And I don't think that it really does. I'm not sure. For example, there's overlap in the way Biden and Trump feel about Afghanistan, right? They both would like to get us out. They both don't know if they can get us out. Um, they're both confused about it. Um, it's a really difficult problem. Most Americans have not given it a lot of thought. I would argue that Trump is one of the Americans who haven't given it a lot of thought. Oh, I, yeah. Okay. Well, let me put it this way. Neither of them, neither of them have come to conclusions about what is best to do. Yes. So if they've given it a lot of thought or a little thought, they've reached in the end similar conclusions and that, and I don't, so a lot of it's not necessarily ideologically mandated. Um, anyway. no, but but, but, but I don't think those are the conversations that people are afraid to have at your synagogue. No, I think they're not. The conversations people are afraid to have are really, truly. So during the beginning of the 2016 or during the 2016 campaigns, I remember I had a disagreement with the editor of Time because she, and I wrote a column about it at the time because she put a, out a cover I think with Trump and Hillary Clinton with dunce caps on saying stupidest election ever, you know, because it, they weren't having high level policy discussions like you're talking about. They were, they were talking about the debates were, were at a very simplistic level, but, but I thought, oh no, we're having a real discussion for the first time in my life. Like the things we're discussing about what America should be, should we let immigrants in? Should we, I mean, these are fundamental questions about what it is to be an American and, and what we think democracy is. Um, and I think there, until you sort that stuff out, uh, I mean, I, you may not even have a country at the end of that. I'll, I, I'm more optimistic about America, um, perhaps than you are, because um, with I, I'm on your father's team. Uh, I actually think that that. Uh, that despite the enormity of the pressures that have exerted themselves on America, it has succeeded and its institutions are resilient. I'm more worried about the democracy in other countries than I am here. And besides, and besides we have the great advantage of America, as I often say, I had these, I had students from NYU Abu Dhabi that Frank Luntz brought to the synagogue and they've never been to a synagogue before. And one of them asked me, why is America successful? And I said, the easiest way to express it is four words. Canada, Mexico, ocean, ocean. That is a huge advantage in the world, right? We don't have natural enemies on our borders. That's a gigantic thing. So that gives me that. I mean, there is a certain like latitude to work out our problems that we have that not all other countries have. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm slightly less optimistic. I don't think democracy is a natural state for a tribal, you know, a tribal animal, which is what we are. And mm -hmm. I think I think every generation has to fight hard to keep the democracy. Uh, so, but I, I honestly, I'm not just saying this to be nice. You and my dad are both way more well-read and way smarter than me. So that, that honestly, I, that, that makes me optimistic that you guys, I, believe, honestly, it does. It makes me feel much better. <laughs> So if it makes you if it makes you feel any any worse, I'm 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 hopeful by nature. I always think things are going to work out. <laughs> it was pandemic, my dad. there's a pandemic. <laughs> um, so, uh, but I am but, generally too. Yeah, I I I I get. I know. I think that it's actually hard to travel around the world and to meet with people and to write about stuff if you don't sort of have a sense like this is gonna go somewhere, this something will, will work. And um, I wonder though, let me ask something else, which is uh, how do you feel about America's position? Forget that for a minute, the leaders long-term trends um, in the world, because obviously until recently, America was virtually unchallenged, certainly post-World War II. And that's not true anymore. Um, it wasn't taken for granted that we would do better with the vaccine than every other country. In 1955, if there had been a vaccine, we would have said, we're going to get the best vaccine and then others may, you know, get some of our, but that wasn't true anymore. So there is a certain preeminence that I grew up with thinking America had that I don't think we take for granted anymore. So how do you see us? 
Well, now you're, you're way out of my bailiwick, but I will say, I think uh, nah. a, little, a little competition is not so bad for our country. I, I like the fact, I mean, I don't like what the Chinese government does to its people. I, don't, I, I think we are competing for values. And I think the Chinese have been more savvy about winning over some of these developing nations by giving them some surveillance technology, giving them some uh, COVID and, uh, vaccines. Like, I think that, that Silk Road has been pretty effective. And I don't like the idea of, of their anti-democratic values becoming popular in all these countries. So, so I think the competition now sound like I'm, you know, a McCarthyite or something, but I do think it, it, there, is a, there, is a, there is a battle for ideology and I would like- For hearts and minds. Better. Yeah. Yeah, for hearts um, and minds. But, but as far as like the COVID vaccine or going to Mars, or I, I love the competition for that. I don't want to be the only superpower, the only country making progress technologically. I mean, I'm, I'm a no. Silicon Valley guy. I want to see like Israel kicking ass and I want to see India kicking ass. And I, I'd, I'd love to see more of that. So are, are you an optimist technologically? Do you think we'll find like, um, I, I don't remember where I was reading recently, somebody said, well, climate change is only gonna have a technological solution. It's not gonna have a behavioral solution. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, again, you, you, I'm just guessing. I don't know anything. I mean, well, I, I, we I, all tend, are. I do tend to think that. I, you know, I, I went to Stanford and um, I, I, I'm not afraid of AI the same way. Wait, other, I wrote a, I've written two covers, one for Time and one for Business Week about the dangers of digital privacy. And I think mm -hmm. all that's real. Uh, and I, I think you shouldn't, you should not carry your phone around all day. Like, I think these, these are bad habits we've gotten into. Um, but in general, I am pretty optimistic uh, about that kind of stuff. So, I, I mean, as long as you, while we're talking about it in terms of bridging differences and bringing us together, um, it, are, are, techno are technology countries, companies becoming more, more powerful in some ways than governments? Should we be afraid of them? Uh, I don't think you want, no, you shouldn't be too afraid, but yeah. I mean, you don't really want Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg making big political decisions because they're gonna make something you don't like. Like, yay, they knocked Donald Trump off and you're happy because you hate Trump. But like, that is, that is, You'd rather not have them controlling um, all the, the means of distribution of information. Like that, that seems, I, I'd rather not trust those guys to that. Would you rather have the government tell them that they can't kick someone off their own platforms? I mean, that. It's tough. I, I'm not, yeah, it's a tough. Uh... It's really tough because you don't want government telling individual companies what they can do. Right. Um, uh, it, it, there isn't an easy solution, but I'm not comfortable with either system because it seems like if you kip, kick someone off of your platform, there doesn't seem to be a robust competition right now for right. other places they can go. Um, yeah, that's true. Yeah, well, this this is there is a, there's definitely a monopoly problem in certain. Uh, yeah. Yeah, at least for the moment. I mean, yeah. Although, um, so, so you have a community of people out there who, um, who are somewhat cut off from, um, even if they're part of the same congregation, they're somewhat cut off from serious discussion about these kinds of issues with people who differ with them. Um, and, uh, what advice do you have for the community itself? Like for the people who believe that they're right and the other people are wrong and, um, and are afraid sometimes that the institutions that they, the schools that they wanna send their kids to, for some of them, um, the synagogues that they wanna to go to are gonna be so antithetical to their values that they feel like foreigners in their own land. I mean, you, I, I do honestly feel like you are one of the few people because our country is so divided geographically that, that are, there aren't that many people like you who are really wrestling with this on a practical level. And I'm, I'm, I'm truly fascinated by how you keep these people together. And it seems it like- It preoccupies me a lot. I think about it all the time, I really do. 
So do you, okay, on a simple level, do you feel like you, oh no, I have to do a bunch of programs to get these people to listen to each other. Or is it more like, let's just push politics out of this space and make this a religious space and where we don't even- So we a little bit do both. I mean, some people are gonna say, why did you have this conversation about politics with him? You shouldn't have done that. Um, and, will and they literally? People, oh yeah, oh yeah. And other people will say, this was a really useful conversation because we got to hear the struggle of the two sides, you know, and, and, and that, that's always, that's always uh, a risk. Um, I think that what I would say is sometimes in our programming, I allow politics in as long as I invite people on the right and on the left and I interrogate both of them. That seems to me fair. So, for example, I had Jeremy Ben Ami and Mort Klein, the left and the right, and we had a program with the two of them together. So somebody could present the far right, and somebody could present the far left, and they could both speak. Um, but yeah, I do. I mean, in my sermons in particular, and in religious things, I really do try to create a space where I I put out a, a, a short video. Now I used to do it every day. Now I do it three times a week, less than a minute message. And I've done hundreds of them now. Not one of them has been political in any way, other than wear masks. If that's a political statement, um, that's it, the only, that's as close as I got to a, is that a political because there was congregation or not masks. True. Masks. Some people got you know. Some people feel like masks is a political issue, but I'll leave that aside for the moment. Um, it certainly wasn't intended as a political statement. Uh, so I really do try to create that space. Um, because I don't want people to feel chased out of their own homes. And, and the synagogue is a home. And when the rabbi says, vote for this guy or don't vote for that guy, it really feels like somebody in your own home is telling you, you don't belong here. But what happens in a world, and that, that seems a great way to navigate a world in which you're just talking about Democrats and Republicans, but what happens when everything becomes politics. What happens? So that's been, that's been hard. It's been really hard. I'll tell you what I said right before the 2016 election, okay? This was the advice I gave. Um, since I knew that you had to say something politically, I, I, I gave a John Rawls sermon. You know, Rawls had this idea. Rawls was this political philosopher and he wrote a theory of justice, which was this very influential work. And he said, basically the idea behind the theory of justice is what he calls the original position you're about to be born into America. You don't know who you'll be. You might be black, you might be white, you might be Indian, you might be uh, Native American, you might be Mexican, you might be smart, you might be stupid. You, you, you have no idea, you might be born to a single mother in a crack house, you might be born you know, in the equivalent of Hearst Castle. What kind of society do you want if you don't know who you'll be? And I said, so, so I just think that you should vote for the candidate who will create the kind of society that you would want if you didn't know, not if you were a rich Jew on the side of Los Angeles, but if you didn't know who you were gonna be, that's who you should vote for. And I thought that that was a fair way of at least getting people to think about their political positions without taking a position. But again, that works when you're just talking about politics qua politics, what happens when everything is politics? What happens when the mask is politics. What happens when like your Instagram page blacking itself out for Black Lives Matter or just not doing it is politics? What, what happens when there's no more, there, there's nothing that, that isn't considered to be one side or the other? Then you got Soros. <laughs> then it's hard. I don't know. But historically, um, like when you read texts, how have, have rabbis from yeah. the ages. I mean, so I, I, I think that there, there have been all the reactions all across the board that you would expect, which is that certain positions, I mean, there are certain political positions that I'm not uncomfortable taking, like um, critical race theory and intersectionality and the anti-Semitism that has arisen like at the heart of it. I have no problem speaking against because something that smacks of anti-Semitism is to me, you know, that's not politics. That's the survival of the Jewish people. Um, and so things that, that strike me as anti-Israel 
to me, that's not Israel is fair game. That's not politics. To me. But but there are so many political questions that I don't feel qualified to pronounce on. And if I do, I'm taking, I think, unfair advantage of the fact that I'm a rabbi, you know, because it doesn't give me. I, I mean, I know that the Torah can be made to speak right and left. There are rabbis who are leftists who quote the Torah. There are rabbis who are rightists who quote the Torah. So if I'm taking a political position and then finding verses to support it, I, I just feel like that's intellectually dishonest unless I confess to it. And I say, look, I'm a right winger or a left winger. And, and you just have to accept that if you're going to come to my synagogue. And that's not the kind of synagogue that I have or want to have. What percentage of your congregation do you think has left? Not necessarily because of your politics. Oh, very, very. Oh, because of the pandemic, we've had no, 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 no. Because they because they don't like the politics of the rest of the congregation. Very small, very, very small. small. So their yeah, their Jewish their Judaism is, is a, a higher mark of their identity than their politics. I think so. Or they found subgroups in the synagogue that they're comfortable with. And they don't, in other words, they found, they sit with a group that agrees with their views and they don't, and they're not constantly bombarded from the pulpit with something that disagrees with. And they know, yeah, okay, so over there, there are people who disagree, but that's okay. They're not in my circle. It's big enough, they have their circle. And so that's comfortable for them. And I think most of the people in the synagogue take some pride in the fact that there is diversity in the synagogue, um, as long as it's not too... I mean, it's a huge congregation, so that's going to happen yeah. maybe by nature. Right. But how do you feel about having a congregation where some people sit with some people and some people sit with other people and maybe they don't really approve of the other people? It's inevitable. It happens, happens in every congregation in the world. <laughs> always. People always have their own like group. That's why the sociologist Peter Berger called it mediating structures. Like you don't really belong to Sinai as much as you belong to the men's club or to the parenting group or to the religious school or that's just I mean that's how people function it's like bowling leagues you know and are some of these like uh subgroups more conservative and some more liberal um actually it's interesting because I think all of them within their group they try to be uh they try to be open um but I think that within friendship circles and within families there are certainly the real, look, the real tension is even less in the synagogue than sometimes within certain families. Um, there are families where, where I, I mean, I heard from people, there were families where especially um, pro or anti-Trump was a, a real challenge for people to be able to sit at the same table and, and talk together. So what advice, do people come to you for advice on how to bring their families together? Yeah, I mean, look, the, the, the best advice, at least to start off with, is just not to talk about it, to talk about other things. Um, it's really, really hard to get people to, once you get into that territory, it's, it's a minefield. Um, it's very difficult for people inside families to disagree that radically about something and to talk about it all the time. I feel weird saying this to a rabbi, and I'm going to regret yeah. it, but... Um... It seems telling Jews not to talk about something is not very Judaic. No, well, I, I'm, I, this is after several unsuccessful attempts to talk about it. And I know that these families are having a really hard time. So I, I don't know what other advice to give them. I don't have effective ways for two people, just as you said, to, who radically view the world differently. And are look, people have lost friendships over this, as you know. Um, so my, my greater concern, rather than to, to have everything discussed, is to try to keep the families together. And, and for at least some of them, this was a real, you know, this was one of those few things that was a real divide. So I belong to this Jewish group called Reboot, um, which I was, know, Reboot. Sure. yeah, so it was a bunch, of, the concept was they would take a, a group of like 30 or 40 youngest 20s 30s jewish people and we go to um the stein erickson lodge in utah and talk about how to reinvent judaism but just really yeah. hang out in the end but one of the things that really divides this group is israel and pal and palestinian rights and that there's yeah. there's a real left left versus center left divide in this group about that 
Um, I think we're able to have civil discussions, but it, it's it's heated. There, there's a real push for yeah. for good versus evil and truth over peace. Um, so so yes, these there these even Israel isn't a safe thing to talk about. I don't think right now. No, I mean Israel. Well, Israel is one of the biggest um, one of the biggest dividing issues. That's not so much a dividing issue in my synagogue, not so much. Um, uh, I think that that's a really hard one between um, right-wing Jews and progressive Jews. Israel is, yes, a savagely divisive issue. Um, or even so progressive and center Democrat Jews. Right? Yeah, yeah. So that's, you know, it's not, it's not an easy time. In that sense, by the way, I think um, I, I think that it may be that that problem will, I, I'm hopeful that that problem will get better, that there's a dynamic starting at work in the Middle East that will make things different, but we'll see. Um, but so it's one thing though, over a dinner, it's one thing at, at a reboot institute, it's another thing over a dinner table where you have generations who have these really different views and different life experiences. And that was one of the things, by the way, especially with the Persian community that I had to always remind myself, which is if there were things that I saw about the world that were different, growing up in Tehran and growing up in Philadelphia give you very different perspectives on the world. And, and just because I have my perspective um, does not invalidate the perspective of somebody who comes from a very different world and has very different experiences. Um, and, and that's really important for me to know. And, and what about having been in Tehran uh, and then having to leave gives you a different perspective on politics than maybe growing up? I would say, I would say two primary things. One is it lets you know how in a second everything you think is stable can be lost. And, and that gives you a deep insecurity about things that lead you, I think, to want to have them nailed down in a way. And the second part of it is, it gives you a trigger reaction to things that seem threatening that you are not willing to say, oh, it'll be, it, it's fine, it'll be okay. Because you have had, you know, You've had this, like, you know, once, let me put, once you've been arrested, every knock at the door could be a policeman. Um, and that's, and that's a very different experience of the world. But that gets a little bit to what I was saying about you and my dad, which is that America is, you know, three, my dad's old. And, and I do, I, I do think most people at most times in the world had their lives right. turned around by something and that that we're naive to think that America, despite the oceans and the kindness of their Canadian Mexican neighbors is immune to that. I mean, right. I don't want to overstate what happened at the Capitol at all. You know, there was, it, it was a small group of people, but, um, but it, it was a taste of that kind of chaos that we usually, we usually uh, think of as in other countries. I agree. Yeah, I agree. And that's, um, and also, by the way, the, the Trump's personality, which was so unlike any president we've ever had, was not necessarily unlike leaders in other parts of the world that people from other parts of the world had seen. So they might feel like he's more familiar to them oh. than he was to us. In, in, a, in, a, in a less scary way, not like, oh, my God. Yes, in a less scary way. It's like this is not oh so he blusters and so he says this and so he does that it's not so it doesn't feel like to us it was like who who acts like that um but there were other parts of the world in which there are leaders who do that and so if you come from that part of the world it's like oh this this feels more familiar right places that have strong men or a berlusconi or like you, you right. know what you're used to yes. seeing like, right it's like don't yeah. don't freak out about this right exactly so so all, all these things are, all, they're always more complicated with different sets of eyes. Was there a moment in the last four or five years where you thought, where your truth 
ran up against your peace in a way where you're like, oh my God, like, like with the gay marriage thing where you're like, I'm going to have to say this thing to my congregation. That's going to cause a schism. Uh, a not a schism, not a schism. The only time that I spoke out in direct criticism that I recall was after Charlottesville. Um, because I thought you cannot say um, that uh, the people who marched with Nazis, he didn't say Nazis were fine people, but he said people who marched with Nazis were fine people. There were fine people on both sides. And I said, look, as, as Jews, we have to say people who march with Nazis are not fine people. Um, but, uh, and, and of course, many people objected to that very much. And the other side of that was that I thanked him for moving the embassy to Jerusalem. And then there were people on the other side who didn't like that. Why, why, would, you make, why would you use his name from the pulpit? And why would you thank him? Um, so at least I felt like I offended on both sides, which, which is always my, it's always my hope. Um, which one did you get more pushback about? Uh, I think the first. I think the first. Wow. I think the Charlottesville one. I think so. Um, because, uh, I don't know, there are, I mean, there are lots of possible reasons, but I think the first. In fact, the Charlottesville one, which was interesting, I was in a debate with Dennis Prager in Orange County, right after Charlottesville, and I said that, and it is the only time that I remember that I got booed by a crowd of Jews, right after I said that. They what exactly booed. did you say that they booed? that you can't say that people who march with Nazis are very fine people and they boot. And I said, look, I, I, I didn't get, I didn't get, didn't get upset. Booing doesn't upset me, but I said, okay. I said, I just want you to go home tonight and ask yourself one question. If Obama had said that, how would you react? That's all I want to know. I said, and if you're honest with yourself, you know, you would have screamed bloody murder. Just like I did, by the way, when Obama said that Israel was a creation of the Holocaust, which I also spoke against. I really try to take specific statements that are objectionable and that I think are wrong and that do the Jewish people harm and criticize them when they come out, whether it's a president of the right or of the left. But people who are partisans of that president don't like it. And I think, in, at least in my experience, I don't believe that any president in my lifetime evoked the same degree of hero worship that Trump did. To the extent where you, you actually could not say anything that seemed negative about him without people getting very, very upset. I know it's only been a little more than a month, but do you feel like within your congregation things have, the temperatures are a little cooler? I don't know. I, I, sadly, I wish I could tell, but I don't know because the pandemic has so cut us off from each other um, that I'm not sure. And the discussion has been so much about the pandemic and not about politics. So. Well, but the pandemic was, it was about politics during the pandemic up until. That's true. Yes. But I'm just saying like, you know, at least right now, I don't know. We'll see when we come back together. Um, I do think, as you said, um, when we talked before, I do think that um, Biden makes a concerted effort not to be as consistently front and center as Trump did. And so that, that makes him less of a target um, than Trump made himself, so. I'm still trying to figure out the fact that when a rabbi says something bad about Nazis, he gets booed. That's a tough world. Yeah, well, it is a tough world. <laughs> it's a, it's, it's a so, tough world. I'm mean, so impressed yeah. by you and do not envy you <laughs> one bit. <laughs> you know what? They, I, I do want to say, I, I really think that it's important to say this. My congregation has been wonderful to me. Even when they've been upset or I've been upset, I really feel incredibly lucky. And I don't want to, to in any way portray this, oh, they're always attacking. It's not true. I've been incredibly supported. And even people, I have had people who say to me, look, I know you disagree with me politically, but I really, I, I respect the fact that you think about what you say and so on and so forth. And so I would rather have someone say that than say, I like you because I agree with you about everything. Um, and that's been my experience. So I really, um, I don't have, and remember I said it was 
to choose in Orange County. It wasn't my own congregation. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, just, I'm still okay on that. Uh, and also, I think, I mean, look, it was, it was even though Dennis uh, Prager and I, we agreed about a number of things, but there was a clear oppositional setup there. It was like, you're going to be on this side or that side. And so, and he was clearly, um, anyway, so what can I tell you? Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's, uh, it wasn't at all the conversation that I thought we were going to have. It well, was I'm sorry. What was no, the conversation? Was better. Better. Something funny. I, I thought we were going to talk about bridging differences. The truth is we covered everything, including bridging differences. We covered bridging differences and lots and lots and lots more, which is so much better than just, in fact, someone just wrote. What an authentic, fantastic conversation. Thank you, Marcy, for saying that. And thank you, Joel, for having it. I know her brother, so she said that on purpose. Um, <laughs> he lives in Berlin, New York. He's a great guy. Yes, yeah. I, I'm torn. I leave here I'm torn on whether it's best for people to not talk about these things or to try and and really be curious and understand the other side. Maybe, maybe that, that's utopic and, and you're right. It's best to just let this hopefully pass and let people stay together as, as Jews, as a group. I think it depends. I think it depends on, on whether they are capable of doing it. Some people will be capable of doing it and 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 a lot of this, I mean, some of it is just the person's individual psychology and psychodynamics. Like the, what you did to, to, to dislike Trump and then to go to a city of Trump supporters and to listen, not everybody can do that. You can do it, but not everybody yeah, can do it. On. So it's easy. I'm not going to. Yeah, but I'm just saying, uh, when other people, other people would, you know, they would just explode. They couldn't do it. It's um, where you land on that continuum to me between truth and peace. And yeah, I, I have yeah. to be far on the peace side because I'm uh, nervous at all times of any confrontation. So, so I wish you peace. I wish you peace too. It's so great talking to you. Thank you so much. And to you. Thanks. Good night, Joel. Night. And good night, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And Alan says hello. Marcy just wrote Good. <laughs> Goodbye.